In this video, I'm going to cover an introduction to equilibrium. So the first thing that we have to look at when we talk about equilibrium is the convention that chemists use with the arrows. So generally when we have been depicting a reaction so far in the class, we've drawn reactants on this side of an arrow, and then a forward arrow, and products on this side of the forward arrow. So um, an arrow that only has one direction, a single arrow, um, typically is used to indicate that all of the reactant molecules are converted to product molecules at the end. So if I start with A plus B, and that goes to C plus D, then at the beginning of the reaction I start with 100% A plus B, and at the end of the reaction all of that is gone and I only have 100% C plus D. That's generally the way that we would interpret this arrow. But a double-headed arrow like this indicates that um, the reaction stops at some point, stops consuming reactant, before the reactant is completely converted into product. So um, this indicates that if I have A plus B, and then this equilibrium arrow, and C plus D, that when the reaction is finished, A plus B is still becoming C plus D, and C plus D reacts to go backwards and become A plus B. All right, so here we have our reaction. So the reaction is A plus BC. So here are my reactants, A and BC. And after they react, I have A, B, and C. So you can see that at the beginning of the reaction, when the yellow hits the uh, purple-gray molecule, I create a new molecule, the yellow-purple one. But the yellow-purple one is a product, and the gray one, C, is a product. And those can react again, can collide again, and go backwards to create A plus B, C. So we interpret this forward and backwards arrow as showing that both reactions are happening. So right now I, I have reactants. I have A and B, C. So now we've uh, um, increased the dimensions of the reaction. We were only reacting along this line in the beginning, and now we're reacting in this two-dimensional box. So the reactions become a bit more complicated and not even as complicated as a three-dimensional reaction, right? If we added the third dimension, it would be even harder for these two to um, collide with each other uh, in the right orientation and with the right activation energy. So let's heat it up a little bit, give it some more energy so we can make a um, effective collision more likely. All right, so now they've got plenty of, of energy and they're moving so quickly that they're gonna collide more often. And since they collide more often, they're likely to have an effective collision and uh, create product. There we go, so the reaction occurred. Oh, and it occurred right back. So you see what happened there was um, we had a reaction where reactants turned to product and then almost immediately the product reactant, the product molecules collided again and underwent the reverse reaction. There we go, the reaction just occurred again. Now I have single C all by itself. And then when C collides with that particle, with that molecule, then we can see if, if the reverse reaction is going to occur. And so we will then have single A all by itself. There we go, A all by itself. Oh, and again, so it was a very strange way for those to react, but they seem to be doing it consistently. So, equilibrium is this. So, equilibrium is this idea. So, equilibrium is this idea that at the beginning of a reaction, I my reactant molecules re react to create product and my product molecules begin to appear. So over time, the concentration of product increases and the concentration of reactant decreases. But I reach a point at which the reverse reaction and the forward reaction start happening at the same rate, and so those concentrations no longer change. So equilibrium is the point at which the, the concentration over time stays constant. So in... Um, kinetics in chapter 12 we were really focused on this part of the reaction the very beginning of a reaction where I have no product 
and I have 100% reactant. And what happens at the beginning? Well, reactant turns to product, and product, excuse me, reactant turns to product, and product accumulates as it's created. Um, and this is the beginning of the reaction where I can talk about the rates and how the concentrations affect the rates. But now in this chapter, in chapter 13, we're going to focus on equilibrium. So we're going to focus over here on this section of a reaction, which is um, when it appears that the reaction has stopped. But as we just saw, the reaction doesn't actually stop, right? The, re the forward reaction occurs, and then those product molecules collide, and the reverse reaction occurs. So what we can see is that if we talk about concentrations, then the concentration at equilibrium uh, does not change anymore. It becomes constant. But the concentrations at equilibrium of reactant and product are not necessarily the same. If I start with 100% um, reactant and 0% product, that doesn't mean that I'm going to end up with 50-50 when equilibrium is achieved. Sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's not. More often, it's not true. The concentrations are not 50-50. They're not even equal at equilibrium. But what is equal at equilibrium are the rates of the forward and the reverse reaction. So you can imagine that at the very beginning of a reaction, before reactants have turned into any product, there is no product around. So when I'm talking about how fast is the forward reaction versus the reverse reaction, well, at the very beginning, the reverse reaction cannot occur. This cannot occur until I create some product. And after these two collide and I've created some product, then the product can go backwards and the reverse reaction can occur. So at the very beginning, here's the rate of the reverse reaction. At the very beginning, the rate of the reverse reaction is zero because it can't occur. It cannot occur until the product is formed. So the reverse rea um, here's the forward reaction. The forward reaction, here's the, the rate is on this axis, right? So the highest point, the fastest rate, is right at the very, very beginning of the reaction when I have no product and I have 100% reactant. So those reactant particles are going to bump into each other and make product. And then right here, as soon as I've created any product at all, then the rate increases from zero to something. And now I have product, and the reverse reaction can start to occur. And as the forward reaction occurs and makes more and more and more product, this line going down means more and more product is being created. Well, as more and more product is created, that reaction, the reverse reaction, goes faster and faster and faster until I reach a point because the forward reaction is going slower and slower and slower, and the reverse reaction is going faster and faster and faster, and they reach a point at which both of those rates become equal. So when we talk about equilibrium, what's equal at equilibrium is the rate of the forward and the reverse reaction, not the concentration. So some reactions reach equilibrium only um, after almost all the reactant molecules are consumed. So sometimes we start with 100% reactant and 0% product, and when we're done, we have about 0% reactant and 100% product. In some reactions, that happens. And we would say that the position of equilibrium favors the products, by which we mean that we have uh, you know, almost 0% reactant left. But even in those situations, where I start with 100% reactant, and at the end I have just about zero, I don't have 0%. It might be 0.0000001%. It might be an incredibly small amount of reactant. But there's always a little bit of reactant left. And if there's not, the product particles will collide with each other, because now there are, there's 100% product. So those product particles will collide with each other, and they'll always create a little tiny bit of reactant. So that ratio, which is 99.9999999999% product and 0.0000001% reactant, that ratio is what we call the equilibrium. And so sometimes when it seems like the reaction is, has completed and there are no reactants left, that's never really true. So every reaction is in equilibrium. Every reaction eventually reaches an equilibrium. And in an equilibrium, it looks like the reaction has stopped, but it hasn't. 
it's always moving forwards and backwards, but at equilibrium it's moving forwards and backwards at the same rate. But when the forward and reverse reaction reach the same rate, then the concentrations stop changing. And so that happens in every reaction. Those that seem like there are no reactant left and other reactions reach equilibrium when only a small percentage of the reactant molecules are consumed. So maybe I start with 100% reactant, 0% product, and then at the end of the reaction, maybe I have 90% reactant and 10% product. And I can let that reaction go on and on and on and on forever for weeks and months and years, and it will never go any further. It stops when, I, when there's 90% reactant and 10% product. Some reactions just, that's their equilibrium. That's when they stop. And so we would say that the position that in that reaction, the position favors the reactants. So at when the reaction appears to have stopped, remember it never really stops, but the, re but the concentrations stop changing. So when the reaction seem appears to have stopped, what's happening is it's going forwards and backwards at the same rate. And sometimes when it appears to have stopped, I have almost 100% products. And sometimes when it appears to have stopped, I have almost 100% reactants. Whether or not which of those cases I'm going to get in a reaction depends on what we call the equilibrium constant. And that is a function of what happens when product molecules run into each other to what does that reaction look like? What is the reaction mechanism? What is the transition state of that reaction versus what the reactant molecules look like? What is, what's their mechanism look like? What's the transition state of, their re, of the forward reaction? What are the activation energies involved with each of those transition states? Those are the kinds of factors that affect the position of the equilibrium. Am I going to have more product at the end or am I going to have more reactant at the end? Well, I have to really look at the stuff we looked at last chapter, the mechanism, the transition state, how A and B actually collide to turn into C. What does that look like? So again, in um, equilibrium, it's kind of like juggling. So this, again, is another, this is like the pinball um, example that we were just looking at, um, where we can say that the jugglers are in equilibrium, which is to say that if you just take a snapshot at any one moment, the jugglers always have about two uh, bowling pins in their hands, right? So if you, if you take a, a snapshot, two, and then you wait a few seconds and take another picture, they still have two in their hands. And you t wait a few seconds and take another picture, they still have two in their hands. So that's because as they juggle, they have this motion, right, that always kind of has them catching and throwing pins, which on average has them catching one and throwing one. So they have two in their hands at any given time. So the number of pin, the number of pins in their hands does not change. So it's like the concentration of the reactants doesn't change, but that doesn't mean that the reaction has stopped. As they juggle, they're constantly throwing particles back and forth. That means that the reactants that start out, the particles that start out as reactants, a minute later, those particles have become products products become reactants and they just keep moving back and forth like this. So a reaction never stops. We can't stop those particles from moving. We can't stop them from running into each other. They're always going to do that. But at some point, the number of reactant particles and the number of product particles becomes constant. 